get ready for the dictation on the count of 3 2 1 start since the 1980s there has been continuous public debate within our country about the desirability of taking a second look at the constitution of India in the light of the rich experience of democratic practice gained since 1947. This debate has acquired a new urgency in recent years partly because of the instability in apex politics and partly also because legal experts, individual politicians and organized political groups within the country feel the need for some changes in our system of governance to render it more efficient and open to popular participation. When we consider the constitution as it was framed in 1950, it is important to remember that there was a prehistory to constitution framing in British India. Our imperial rulers has attempted to create constitutional systems with limited democratic sanctions in 1909, in 1919 and in 1935. These constitutions drew upon certain principles which we can repeat with profit today. According to democratic theory, constitutions can either be constructed on their basis of Whig principles or they can rest upon liberal principles. Whig constitutions attempt to mobilize like-minded social communities and interest groups, while liberal constitutions reach out to the individual citizen and are based upon territorial constituencies. The British created Whig instead of liberal constitutions in India because through drawing upon vested interests within society, they could strengthen their rule by coming into existence counterpoised social groups. In contrast to the constitutional structure drafted by the British, the nationalist leadership has attempted to create a truly liberal restrictive framework for a liberated India in 1928. This constitution rested upon the adoption of adult franchise. Such a recommendation was a revolutionary measure in view of the fact that democratic theory does not necessarily advocate the extension of voting rights to those who are illiterate nor does it support the provision of voting rights for those who are devoid of property. Needless to say, in the period in question, the majority of Indians did not satisfy either of these conditions. When we interrogate the nationalists' debate on the business of an appropriate constitution for India in the last phase of the freedom struggle, we discover that there was considerable difference of opinion on the desirable relationship between a pan-India center of governance on the one hand and the regional centers of governance on the other. This should also be taken note of. One of the harsh realities of political life in South Asia at the time when the Constituent Assembly of India was engaged in its task was the fact that the British Empire broke up into two sovereign units. The decision of the Muslim majority provinces of British India to continue themselves into Pakistan aroused the apprehension in the minds of the nationalist leadership in India that they might have to face further attempts at secession from a future Indian unions. As a result of 
this apprehension the gandian notion of a truly decentralized and federal india did not receive the serious attention in the debate on the constitution which otherwise deserved if an unwarranted centralization of power was the crucial weakness of constitution of 1950 then its great strength lay in conferring voting rights on every adult member of indian society indeed it would be no exaggeration to assert the exercise of the right to vote by the citizens of india has more than anything else sustained the republic over the past 6 decades as we dwell upon the provision of the indian constitution from the vintage point or the of the late 1990s we cannot but be struck by the wisdom and the courage with which the founding fathers of the nation laid down the rules by which democratic practice in the country was to be shaped let us consider the question of the presidential form of governance which enjoys support in some circles today the framers of the constitution were ac- acutely conscious of the fact that they were devising rules and procedures designed to shape liberal practice in a very diverse and highly plural society indeed so diverse are the social constituents of our na- nation that it is difficult to imagine that a president even one elected directly on the basis of adult franchise could represent the rich diversity and infinite variety of indian society as against this the so called westminster model with provision for a broad based cabinet headed by a prime minister all drawn from an elected legislature provides a much more appropriate and resilient mechanism for the governance of a highly plural society it is widely believed among that the first past the poll system puts a heavy premium upon political stability in a society this is brought about by giving a majority in the legislature to a political party even when the number of votes it receives i may be less than half the total number of votes cast this may not be very healthy stability